Um, so uh, I think we we should start with a a little uh, encapsulation of what we know about the industry, what I've personally experienced in the industry, and you pro hopefully relate to this. Let's say that we're writing uh, software at a big company. We've got anywhere between 50 to 1,000 developers. Uh, we've got a lot of legacy code. Uh, we have uh, something that approximates documentation, but not really exactly uh, what I would I ideally have as documentation. You've got maybe APIs that you can call. Maybe you've got uh, fancy developer tooling as far as uh, internally uh, hitting, hitting APIs, hitting services. Service composition is, is the, the way that we do everything, but it's also a lot of just writing bespoke HTTP clients and HTTP servers that probably follow the spec, maybe adhere to internal standards, but not, not to the degree that you would like. So how can we solve that? How can we fix that? Let's look at uh, the, first, the first thing you would want to do if you're trying to uh, take an existing code base and, and try to get information out of it is to use macro annotation, open API specification. Like how do you, how do you reflect out what your code is doing from the actual code itself? Uh, a problem with that is how do we know that the specification is correct? How do we know that what it's actually getting out of the code is in fact the entire data model? What about all the different branches of your HTTP status codes? All, all of that stuff is, it's there in your code, but you kind of have to find it. Uh, additionally, uh, what about the, if we, if we migrate to a library abstraction that, that attempts to put encoding as a first class uh, concept in the actual library that you're using, and then just call like two HTTP routes or or two specification, not calling out any any uh, library in particular here. But the the challenge there is now you've got a whole bunch of extra boilerplate. Uh, this boilerplate's not a, not always bad as we've seen in the previous talk, but the this is not something that I, as a user of this library, want to have to deal with at all times. I, I, I want to be focused on writing business logic. I want to be focused on actually writing code, and then just relying on the fact that my code is going to be able to be mounted onto some sort of network socket. Maybe I want to be able to, to also plug in uh, the, the actual business logic into my test adapters instead of having to write a whole bunch of mocking infrastructure or bind to test ports. And you've seen slow tests. Slow tests are often because you end up binding to a socket. You have to run your tests against that socket, and then you have to unbind. That all takes time. Uh, so that's, that's additional complexity I don't want to have to worry about as a user. And, and then additionally, we've, we've already got a lot of, of code that's out there. And we also have a bunch of different teams that are working on different parts of this ecosystem that we're either building or maintaining. All of that is stuff that we're going to have to, to either fold in or we're going to have to duplicate. So every team that's writing potentially in a different language, potentially using different libraries, all of those people are writing the exact same strings in each service, right? You're, you're, you're talking about either you can do uh, code sharing via libraries, internal package, package libraries, or you can, uh, you, can, you can try to do some sort of no, I, I, so if you're, if you're doing internal libraries, you have to then uh, deal with dependency management and, and all of those things, which we ideally would also like to not have be uh, too onerous for, for the developers, right? So uh, what, we, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a specification first uh, environment that takes care of all of that. Uh, uh, I, I chose OpenAPI. Uh, swagger back when this project started, but, but specification first uh, gives us at least a firm foundation to resolve the, uh, the, the, the first, how do we know whether or not the code that we're, that we're writing adheres to the specification? If you have a specification first as part of your build pipeline, instead of just some tacked on bit of documentation somewhere, you can actually check your implementation against that specification. So instead of, I, I have to try and figure out whether or not the specification, which is a constrained environment, maps to the code that I have, which is, let's say, an unconstrained 
uh, generic programming language. You, you have lots and lots of different functionality you can use, uh, but I, I can't always, I can't map one to one between every line and, and the specification. I, I want to be able to go from, from most constrained to broad, open, bring your own code, bring your own business logic. Uh, and then additionally, we, we want to be able to reuse a lot of the existing infrastructure. We, we want to be talking about uh, the, the integration with something like Postman for issuing HTTP requests uh, against your service. You, you may even already have open API specifications in your company uh, for your team. Maybe it's something that you have its best effort but not necessarily something that you can rely on as, as being the gold standard for truth, and maybe you've got an, an open API specification you publish for your entire company, and people are constantly opening up pull requests, like, hey, by the way, you, you forgot this, this note, or this function's not correct, or this parameter's missing. These are all real-world problems that actually exist, and for real companies. Uh, so having a better developer relations, developer advocacy. This is, this is an entire team in some companies, but we can do this just by the nature of using tools that, that favor this, this uh, method of development. Um, additionally, if I were to design a piece of software that would uh, allow me to separate the HTTP, which is, an HTTP is a massive domain, right? You're, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about the entire scope of what methods exist, all of the different encoding and decoding, all the headers, all that stuff. Those, that's all plain text. That's all actually encoded plain text over the stream. HTTP is a massive specification. My code is not a massive specification. My code is a very well-confined function that I, I have nice types for in Scala. I want to be able to talk about those types. I want to be able to talk about that, those domain objects. I want to be able to speak in the business domain and have that either be directly mapped in the case of uh, an open API service. I want to be able to talk about that service and my domain having some sort of relation. But I also don't want to have to deal with the entirety of open, or I, want to, I don't want to have to deal with the entirety of HTTP when I'm writing just a simple business logic. I, I want to be able to, to say, this is not only testable, but I also want to be able to, to test it in a way that's not having every single function be, okay, I'm going to write a bespoke HTTP client, I'm going to construct this, this specific request body, and I'm going to blast that into this thing. We've got types. I, I'm going to kind of keep focusing on the types here. We've got domain objects. We've got types. Why can't we use that for the entire lifespan of our business rules, our business logic. So additionally, if we have a, an, a common interface, we can abstract away the, the, the nitty gritty of each individual underlying library that we're using. So if we, for instance, let's say we've got some teams using OCK HTTP, some teams using HTTP for us, some teams using Zio HTTP, all of these are different code bases and each of them have their own idioms, which is valuable, uh, but not valuable when we're talking about the actual core business logic. We, we want to focus on the underlying aspects of, can I go from this library to this library to this library? Or maybe we want to start migrating to the same library. Maybe let's say, uh, if you're reading the news, license changes for a major piece of software that will be unnamed, and suddenly force a bunch of people to migrate to a different HTTP library. Let's just say that happens. Uh, <laughs> it would be nice to be able to change a configuration language or a configuration file and then get a completely different targeted library from your existing code base. Uh, you, you should have that level of abstraction, and I can, uh, I'm happy, happy to say that you can do this today. Oh, let's talk about how in a bit. Uh, and then additionally, if we're talking about uh, things that I want, uh, I, I really want uh, real domain objects. I really want uh, high quality code. I want no exceptions. Like I, I, a, a small aside here. Um, this talk is about guardrail. Haven't mentioned the name of the project yet, but here it is. Uh, I didn't want to write this. I wanted to use the standard tooling. 
Unfortunately, we didn't have a good Scala first set of tools at that time that conform to the kind of expectations that we have as Scala developers. Lots of nulls, lots of exceptions. These are standard things that you find in a lot of languages. That didn't sit well with me when I wanted to start migrating an existing code base over to using generated, uh, generated clients initially and then moving on to generated servers. I wanted to have nicer toys to play with. So uh, I also needed to be able to say, Let's, let's try to onboard this, and if we run into something where there's a bug in Guardrail itself, I want to be able to, to pull the lever and have an escape hatch in that one function, or worst case, let's say the worst happens and you find some sort of major either security vulnerability or some sort of um, exception that your, your model is special and you, 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 need to, you need to ship something fast, but additionally, you want the, you, you want all the niceties, but you, you also still need to, to go in and, and monkey patch something. It would be nice to just have real files that exist on the file system. Turns out you can put things in source managed. Who knew? Uh, so we don't actually need to do a whole bunch of, of fancy macro stuff for this. And I'm being nice to the macro people. Um, I hate macros. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of complexity for, um, let's say, marginal gain, uh, especially when you're talking about large code bases. Uh, large code bases of generated macro stuff, it puts a lot of onus on the user to actually maintain that complexity. So let's uh, give a, a, a hat tip to the Scala Meta people. What an amazing library that is. We can use that to write a project called Guard Guardrail. Uh, this is the logo, uh, which you may have seen around uh, this is a picture that I took in Iceland, uh, which I thought was, was particularly uh, amusing because you can see up on the top there, uh, that's the edge of a massive cliff where you would fall into a giant ravine. Uh, so this, I, I felt, was particularly uh, representative of how I felt as a developer working in a, a code base where lots and lots of people are trying very hard to not break things. Uh, so here we are with Guardrail. Uh, if you, if you already have an open API specification or if you've used open API, open API before, you may have seen some, something like this on the left. Uh, if not, it's pretty much uh, exactly what you would expect. But the important thing is, from all of that stuff on the left, we want to get what we have on the right. Uh, being able to do that quickly is, is ideal, critical. Um, but then additionally, being able to do that in a reproducible way is also pretty critical. So being able to have build tooling that is integrated with your uh, build plugins or, or any of that, so SBT, Maven, uh, even Gradle, uh, Mill, I, somebody's using it for Mill. Uh, the, the main thing is I want to be able to regenerate the entire source tree every time that the input specification changes, right? This is, this is key. If you don't have your specification as part of your build pipeline, then you really don't have a specification. You have assertions or you have uh, aspirations, but you don't actually have something tangible that you can, you can point at and say, that is correct, that is incorrect. Um, uh, sorry, people pointing out over here, this is not, not you. Uh, just the, the, you know, anyway, point is, the, uh, if, we're, if we look at what the actual generated code uh, looks at and does, we can also see the, uh, an important aspect of this is the separation of the underlying HTTP uh, domain. We're talking about the, the abstraction of the relevant bits of HTTP and in terms of domain objects. So if we have, uh, if we know all of the valid types of my function, if my function has a, a, a specified set of responses, then I should be able to just have that exposed as an object that I can call methods on, and then if my specification changes, then my code should stop compiling. And this is what I mean by specification first. If, you, if that is your expectation of how your development lifecycle works, where you start with your specification, and if you, if you change, for instance, now you have uh, OK has been renamed to continue, or to um, not continue, to let's say created, uh, it should not be possible to respond with a 200 anymore. I want that gone. 
And then additionally, I don't want that gone via some sort of magic that happens internally to something that I can't test. I want to be able to call that function and see that response. We can do that. Turns out you can just take the exact same uh, trait, you can implement the trait, you can either pass that off to a routing layer, in this case it's Aka HTTP, we have uh, support for HTTP4S, and we are getting support for Zio HTTP soon. Uh, somebody's working on that right now, actually. Uh, or if I have that handler, let's say I'm writing tests, I can just pass in login response and I can get back a future of the response object, right? Like this is, this is the, the, the ultimate in, for, in terms of how do I make tests that don't suck? Turns out, call the function. Who would have thought that that's a, an, an important case of, of uh, being able to test things effectively? So additionally, uh, there's a lot of, let's say, gotchas, right? The, there's, there's a, if people are familiar with developing OK HTTP, you may be familiar with discard entity, discard entity bytes. Uh, this is a common uh, thing that is oft forgotten, as it turns out, where if you forget to discard the entity bytes, then you just have an open socket that just, like, the stream is there, hanging out, you can start consuming memory, and, and maybe it goes away. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, so you want to be able to, to automatically have that handled uh, because that's noise. I, I, as a developer, don't want to have to deal with that. I, as a library maintainer, I want to deal with that because that's my domain, that's not your domain. Uh, the important thing is being able to solve those sorts of problems. Uh, we, I, I didn't mention on the previous slide, but we also support generating for Java and Spring and this JSR something plugin. I went straight from Haskell to Scala. I don't know these things. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the stuff that you can do in Java is also quite perplexing to me why things are exactly structured the way they are. But having an abstract class that I can provide implementations for, pass that into a routing layer, and have that just come out with a Spring Boot service, and that's, that's kind of nice. I want to be able to do that. So it turns out you can. Um, not having to deal with the gotchas in Spring Boot, pretty good. Uh, additionally, I want to be able to talk about similar idioms across the different libraries that I'm using. So I mentioned earlier migrating from Aka HTTP to, let's say, HTTP for S. I've done this. Uh, Aka HTTP bounded by future, uh, HTTP for S bounded by F. You can, uh, with minimal changes, talk about the, the alterations in your return type for your uh, your for, comp uh, for comprehension, where instead of just producing a future, now you can produce some, some F-bounded something or other. And it just works. The reason it just works is because your business logic doesn't change. Your, the, the types that you're targeting change, but the, the shape of your code doesn't really change that much from library to library. If you get out the library-specific routing DSL, if you get out the, the underlying aspects that are particular to each each language, which I guess is a, a bit of a, a bit of a cop out, because yes, the, the, the differences between languages are different. But if you can find the commonality, and the commonality is business logic, then being able to abstract that and call that function, it turns out that that is remarkably similar between libraries. And then finally, uh, I want real code. I want something that I can look at. I want to be able to, to poke at it and see without using IntelliJ's expand macro feature. I want to be able to, to grep the existing code base. I want to be able to find existing patterns, and I want to, to understand why something is working the way that it is without having to go into the actual source code for the entire library. Uh, absolute worst case break glass situation is comment out the SBT plugin and then move source generated into source tree, and suddenly you can modify the, the generated source code. But Importantly, you can then, once the bug is fixed, delete that part of the source tree and then go back to the plugin. This is uh, the, 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 the regeneration of all of the source code from your specification every time is a feature that I see missing in so many code gen plugins. Like this is, it doesn't have to be, I'm gonna generate all of this code for you and then now it's your problem. You go and, and maintain this forever, which I, I don't know why this is a common idiom, but it is. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the, the generated code lives in normal files. Turns out, an important feature of, of, uh, of being able to manage complex code bases. 
Um, so given that, uh, we, we, we have specification first, first as a concept. Uh, I wanted to, to revisit that and just, just harp on this is, I, I think maybe a contentious view because there's a talk coming later that, that takes the exact opposing viewpoint to this talk. Um, I, you know, I think there's, there's space for both. Um, I personally prefer specification first because I want my type system to be the thing that is confirming my assertions about what the specification says and vice versa. I want those things to match. And you have to have both of them as part of your, uh, part of your compilation uh, pipeline. You want the specification to generate the code that is then confirmed by your business logic, expectations match, and then you've got something that you can actually trust. Uh, additionally, I want the, the business logic to be as far away from the implementation of the routing layer as I can. Uh, I, I want that for not only testability to make my tests faster, I want to be able to talk about, like, if you're using some F-bounded uh, library like, like, uh, like CATS, uh, or HTTP4S, rather, you can provide the identity monad as a, a, an implementation for F that, that satisfies all the constraints of your business logic, and then suddenly, not only is your code not waiting for HTTP sockets to be bound or whatever. Your code isn't even waiting for flat maps to happen. Your, your code is, is executing right then and there, and so your tests become significantly faster uh, and, and with, with negligible impact on the actual performance characteristics of your, the, the, co the code that you're testing. You don't have to do all of this fancy stuff with mocks. You can just use real code. Uh, you can actually do a fun thing, which is generate the client library from your same specification, but in the test scope in SBT, and then from your routing layer that you've generated in your actual main HTTP, you can actually turn that into an, a function from HTTP request to an, a future or an F of HTTP response. This is a common thing that's, that uh, I found in many different libraries, so it doesn't matter if you're OCK HTTP or uh, uh, HTTP for S. Uh, Zio HTTP probably has a similar thing, that being able to take that function and then pass that into the client library and have the client library say, great, I've got a function. Turns out, you don't need to bind HTTP sockets at all. You just call the function, and you're round-tripping through HTTP by way of internally maintained uh, domain models of what the HTTP is maintained by the library authors. But your code is still using your domain logic and your domain terms in order to to write your tests in. So uh, this is, you, you, this, it's a thing you can have today. Uh, I, uh, I actually, one, one more, uh, I'm gonna go to this slide and talk about one more thing. Uh, there was a particular inflection point uh, in this project where we had a new hire who didn't, know, who didn't know Scala, who was trying to convert an existing API over to Guardrail internally at a company that Guardrail was written at. The, the developer got to a point where <laughs> they came to me and said, I can't make this code compile. I can't make this work. Turns out that the way that the authorization was implemented previously was if your authorization is provided internally by some internal library framework stuff, then use that. Otherwise, if your authentication is provided by some other, uh, like HTTP header or something like that, then use that. Otherwise, it's all right. Provide without authentication, <laughs> proceed without authentication. Uh, that authentication was the gate into internal database queries. So if any part of that infrastructure had failed, then completely unbounded HTTP calls would be accessing every single user in the entire company in the database. So uh, just trying to migrate over to something that was specification first where you can't make that kind of mistake, turns out that, that it, it solved the problem. We didn't even know this was a bug. And then it turns out, yeah, uh, no, using, using specifications to conf, uh, constrain what you can do in your business logic and vice versa is, is, is critical, being able to actually point at that and say, that's not right. And not only is that not right, it's so not right, I can't even do that, um, is, I, it, I think that's a feature. So 
uh, given that, I think that's my time. Uh, I appreciate uh, you all, and then also the conference, conference organizers. Thank you very much.